Okay, now it's being recorded, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so this recording will be shared with you all after this event. Um, so we will distribute this via the registration link for those who have registered for these event uh, via email. Um, and secondly, feel free to introduce yourself and the school that you're from uh, in the chat and any other general uh, chatting or communication via the chat. Um, and if you do have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. Uh, we have some representatives, uh, Catherine and uh, Meta from uh, UNAP, who will be assisting in prioritizing these queries, uh, in addition to myself, Rio and Adam uh, to assist with these as well. So please use the Q&A feature and uh, we will prioritize the key questions uh, that can be addressed during the, uh, during the session today and also uh, during the Q&A session, uh, which I'll bring to screen now. Um, just so just for the agenda uh, for this webinar, uh, firstly, we'll just do a quick welcome to the Canvas community, uh, which uh, Rio and Adam will be taking care of. Um, and then uh, moving on to uh, Jason Devilia from UNAP uh, to do an introduction of the Philippines Canvas user group, the topic and presenter today. And then we'll pass it over to Za uh, or Jessa for the presentation and the Q&A sessions. All right, uh, Rio, if it's OK, I'll pass it over to you um, and I'll stop sharing screen and pass it over. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, we work in the priority services team. And so we, we do a lot of these webinars and uh, distribute it to your admins. So uh, we, the intention is to work with your, you know, the, the, this, uh, this uh, member of the user group team um, and to kind of uh, come up with some solutions to kind of distribute it to the wider audience as well. So that, uh, you know, your admins can share it with your teachers so that we can get, have more engagement through through these webinars so that it's, you know, uh, teachers are able to attend, et cetera. Now, uh, if you haven't seen this before, I am gonna put it into the, to the chat and I hope it doesn't get lost because there's a lot of chatter going on at the moment. Uh, but uh, this is our community space uh, where we put all of our past webinars uh, any future webinars will also go up there as well. So this, this recording will be placed up there. If you want to bookmark that, uh, I think it's a good idea because there's some content there that uh, you know, we've done in the past that is, I think will be very beneficial for you. Uh, I know a few of you uh, have attended some of our webinars in the past, but uh, if you haven't or haven't had the opportunity to do so, uh, you know, it's worthwhile kind of just bookmarking that and you know, checking out some of the content. So it's a global kind of priority services hub. So it's not just content from you know, uh, the APAC team, it is content from our global PS team. So you know, our priority services team in NORAM as well as in EMEA kind of creating all of this content and that, that, that is, uh, you know, we think is useful for all of our customers. So definitely check, check that out. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's my piece. I'll, I'll hand it back over to you, Ramsey. Thanks, Rio. Um, and uh, as Rio mentioned and shared the link there, uh, you'll find the Global Priority Services Hub um, there up on screen. Um, and yeah, so we can distribute that in addition to the Zoom link. Uh, we can include that link um, to all the participants as well. All right, fantastic. Uh, so continuing on. Um, so just quickly, um, so over the past years, uh, we've uh, seen an increasing amount of Philippine institutions that have come on and started uh, utilizing a learning management system and specifically Canvas in region. Um, over the years, pre-COVID, so as you look at these photos, <laughs> the context is pre-COVID. Uh, unfortunately, it's been a while since we've been able to uh, engage and communicate face to face. but. Essentially, uh, at this point, we are looking to uh, re-engage the community via the online, um, considering that we've now been uh, approximately now a year and 18 months of being online. Uh, so working closely with the Philippines Canvas user group, which I'll pass it over to Jason shortly, uh, just to share further details around that. Um, so Jason, um, over to you. Thank you, Ramsey. So, uh, okay. Um, I just wanted to introduce the Can Philippine uh, user group uh, committee. Um, so I'm Jason Devilla. I come from the University of Asia and the Pacific and um, working together with us is um, uh, Chang Basa from the University of the East, uh, Ling McDermott from the Far Eastern University, Gion Fabella from Jose Arizal University and Jasper Alantaga from De La Salle University. Uh, Ramsey, I think we should be adding Marily uh, here from the University of the Philippines, Manila. So um, essentially, we are representatives from institutions that have been on campus for some time. Um, for UANP, we're entering our fourth year of campus use. Uh, for a good number of the other institutions represented on this committee, they're going on their fifth year. So um, 
and we kind of um, got together and we, for the past uh, few years, we've been talking a lot amongst ourselves about um, how to make the most out of the LMS, how to share best practices. And now that a lot more institutions have um, come on board Canvas, um, we've um, been working together to try to put together activities and materials which we think will be really helpful, especially for all the new users. Um, in essence, what we'd like to do is to help make your transition to Canvas a lot smoother than ours. Um, most of us had to, with, with support from Instructure, we've had to figure out things on our own sometimes. Um, and we hope uh, to share uh, important lessons and best practices with you throughout a series of activities over the coming months and even over the coming years. Okay, so I just, uh, that's it for the Philippine user group. So uh, look for, I look forward to um, working with the other committee members to organize more webinars and even face-to-face -face meetings when uh, IATF uh, begins allowing us to get together again face-to-face. Okay, so I just wanted to spend a few minutes uh, introducing today's webinar. As Ramsey said, uh, today from my institution, we'll be sharing practical lessons from a year's worth of online teaching. Um, in, we are a year and a half into the pandemic and we've spent one entire school year trying to deliver our courses online. Um, we were lucky enough to have Canvas ready, uh, ready to go when, when the community quarantines began and we've spent, we've just finished an entire school year delivering all our courses via campus and a few other online tools. I just wanted to highlight two things when, before we start the presentation. First is that I think all of us understand that stakes are high for the Filipino youth because we have no idea when we will be able to hold face-to-face -face classes again, even if only on a limited basis. So moving forward, as we start, as we prepare for a new school year, I think we all have to do our best to get online teaching right and facilitate learning in spite of the many challenges to effective online teaching. Second, the post-pandemic scenario will be different from the pre-pandemic one in that online tools and platforms will continue to play a significant role in teaching. So we really need to embrace technology, not just for this transition period, but also for the long run. And with that as a background, um, the series of webinars for this month, uh, this week, next week, and the week after are meant to uh, impart uh, knowledge, uh, practical knowledge to, especially to new Canvas users uh, to help you go through this transition to online teaching um, a bit more smoothly than we ourselves uh, did when we, when we were trying to, to get on the technology train uh, more or less on our own with, a, with some help from instruction. So with that said, I'd like to introduce the speaker for today. Uh, she's Ms. Jessa Alises, uh, but we all call her Zap. Uh, and she's the one who manages can everything related to Canvas for our institution. Um, just for context, we are a relatively small university with about 2,000 students. And every term, we manage Canvas for about 2,000 students and about 250 teachers. Um, but we've also spent the past school year doing quite a lot of uh, learning experience evaluations. And what she's going to share with you will, be, will have been called from uh, the results of those evaluations. So what we're going to do this morning is share with you um, what we've learned, especially from students' uh, feedback about what work and what doesn't work uh, in delivering content online, especially within the Canvas LMS. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to our uh, present to our speaker for today, Ms. Zahelises. Thank you, Sir Jason. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to the instructor team and to my teammates from UANT, Sir Jason, Micah, and Kathy, and to everyone here who has come out. I see the numbers still rising, and I'm feeling nervous because of that. But I hope you all get something from my presentation for today. So let me share my screen so I can get started. Can you all see my screen? I hope yes. Okay. Hang on. <laughs> A 
Okay, let me try that one more time. There. Okay. So I'll be talking about instructional design for today and the practical lessons after a year of online lear learning. So a little way back Wednesday to the pre-pandemic times when everything was physical. So we all went to campus, you know, um, school building, classrooms, and everything that we can see, touch, and, you know, even smell. We have the smell of the cast garden welcoming us every time. So with that, we also have access to people, you know, we see our classmates, teachers meeting their students, classmates, uh, friends, coworkers, and so we have access to facilities, materials, equipment, venue. And for some, there are really important people who help us throughout it. So for teachers, we have the admin assistants and program officers who help them get through their schedule and with their deliverables to their classes. And students um, see their friends and their reliable classmates who probably have good notes, which they photocopy. So we have all the access right with us physically and everything was just available. So with that, at least for our school, Canvas was barely used. And you know, a learning management system isn't really an option in your typical pre-pandemic day to day. Um, however, we have a few tech savvy teachers who explored a few functions, although utilization was still at a bare minimum. So as observed during the pre-pandemic, here are the few Canvas teachers that were explored by our teachers. So some teachers actually used attendance, although they had negative feedback about it because apparently it takes a while to load. So one of the hacks they did was to preload it in the faculty room where there's significantly or relatively stronger Wi-Fi. But then, you know, if they forget to do that, or if they don't know that hack at all, they just use their own mobile data just to facilitate attendance taking. Discussions for that matter was sort of an alternative to in-class discussion, recognizing that there are students who are not really good with face-to-face um, -face or in-person discussion. So that was an opportunity for them to earn some points if they uh, attended the class and left it without speaking a word. Uh, the course files proved to be friendlier than Google Drive because there's no need to generate a sharing link and that, you know, everything uploaded is automatically shared to the class list. As for the gradebook, it was utilized only for encoding of the final grades. So given that level of proficiency from only a handful of teachers, you know, during the emergency remote teaching phase at the onset of the pandemic, um, Canvas, unfortunately, was not the automatic option for carrying on with the rest of the semester in a remote setup. Um, it was a mad scramble, to say the least, to finish the semester. So everything was um, translated to emails and Zooms because there was really no facility for all of the planned lesson that was intended for a face-to-face -face classroom setting. So needless to say, we discovered that a lot of the course design, if not entirely, it's problematic. And we have three things observed um, in that problematic course design. So first it was indigestible. So teachers found out that they have too much content or unmoderated content. Um, personally speaking, as a former student of UANP myself, I did go through that phase of having so many readings for just one lesson topic. And, you know, in my time, we were lucky that we never had any of this. Uh, we never had the situation where you had to learn from home. So, you know, uh, the readings, many as they were, the teacher was there to help us process things and our classmates were there to throw out their ideas and we all discussed and communicated with that. But, you know, leaving your students with a pile of readings to stare at home and make the most out of it without any sort of intervention or without enough intervention, that's really overwhelming. Next is that we saw how inflexible the learning activities are and assessment tasks. So apparently now, especially at this time, they're outdated and have become misaligned to the learning goals. And also, sorry, um, 
materials were inaccessible. So they're either all over the place or unavailable. Suddenly we don't have the library, we don't have the printer, we don't have the photocopier. We don't have our classmates <laughs> to share notes with. Okay, so our answer to that is um, two things. But first, let me give you some student feedback that we've received based on the three flaws of our course design. So yeah, like I said earlier, there were too many readings and students are having a hard time processing all of that by themselves without you know, at least the support from their friends. They can't meet up to discuss about themselves. Requirements were limited to either emailing. Um, teachers just probably send in exams or email, but uh, emailed them questions, and they expect that you know a file upload with the answers. Or many teachers also heavily relied on Zoom meetings, so there wasn't enough opportunity to earn a grade. But not you know apart from that, and more than that, there's limited opportunity to learn because the learning activities and the assessment tasks were suddenly, you know, it was just brought down to two. Um, some students had the shock of their lives to receive their long exam, okay, via Canvas quizzes, but it's their first time to use it. Like, I suppose the teacher sat one week and down to learn how to use quizzes and decided, you know, um, automating my exam will help me facilitate my checking, yes, but for students who's going to use quizzes for the first time, they really find navigation difficult. And of course, um, being that there are no more venue, the, the library is no longer there and you have no more photocopiers. So all the resources all over the place and there's no one repository to refer back to. So teachers started utilizing Google Drive and files more, but there's really no concrete structure to where the resources are related to and which lessons they cover. So um, ultimately, as a whole, um, with this very imperfect course design, class standing was also unavailable until the end of the term, when you know a lot of the students are surprised that apparently they haven't been doing well, or they could have done something had they known that their class standing was such. So for all of this, um, oh well, so here is the illustration of what that course looks like, the problematic course design. I hope everyone here is well past this phase. Um, so if you will see the modules are really half structured. Um, it looks like it's an attempted plan, but you can see some items still unpublished. So uh, clearly there's no uh, record or documentation of the lesson flow or the syllabus flow. So let's not do this anymore, okay? All right, so here are our two solutions, highly intertwined, closely intertwined with each other. So first is LMS training, because our teachers had very limited proficiency of Canvas um, during the pre-pandemic times. Of course, um, it wasn't their option to use when the lockdown happened. And of course, um, when the proficiency to navigate Canvas is already established, then they can proceed to the course redesign. So our concrete response to that was to hold or produce our own version of the Learning to Teach online course. So you can see here are two most important modules. So we heavily uh, brought them the lessons and pedagogy, um, specifically on constructive alignment, taxonomies, and appropriate teaching and learning activities, as well as assessment, specifically for the online setting. And right after that is the module on constructing an online course using Canvas. So we had them create a sandbox course, um, literally planning out their syllabus inside Canvas already. So here we required them to create at least three modules that they actually intend to carry out for the semester with at least three TLAs and ATs. So they'll have a really good idea of how their syllabus will flow or will be fleshed out when the step starts. So the thing with our Learning to Teach Online course or LTPO is that we 
admittedly, this is really heavy on theory and it shocked some of the teachers who weren't really education graduates and for those who are mostly industry practitioners. So they felt like they themselves were going back to school. But the good thing is that I believe uh, bringing them back to the theories of pedagogy will, you know, um, it will cover all bases and it will lead them to the appropriate course design that they should be giving their students. And with that theory, while it is very heavy on theory, we also had exercises that are very practical and hands on and automatically just makes them familiar with Canvas navigation all in all. So all of that, um, it starts with a mastery of the learning management system for us to build an efficient course design. So really, um, it's really knowing your tools at hand and knowing the best way to use them, no matter how simple it is. So it could only be one or two features, but the important thing is you know how to use them well and where to use them best. So here I'll be showing you um, an exemplary course I found in our system. So this is for a Shakespeare class. Um, you can see this is the home page. This is the top half of the home page. Um, the teacher included the recent announcement feed on the home page so that it's a quick reference for the students. They don't need to click to announcements to see what's new. And you can see she has those black circles, which are actually shortcuts to the important things in her class. So we have the syllabus, learning plan, student handbook, uh, list of readings, grade book, um, consultation sheet, sign up, and MLA citation guide. And here, the last one is, I think this is Shakespeare's face. So it might be a biography page. So this is the top half of her homepage. And this is the bottom half. Okay. So in the LTTO course that we produced, we also taught our teachers to be a little, you know, creative and a little, um, a little adventurous with their aesthetics. So aside from a really good course design internally, we thought, you know, packaging also works for some students. So here, uh, if you can see the teacher put a portrait, a picture of a balcony, which she used as her module banners, right? So here we go further into her module. So she has here a module zero or her introductory module. So if you will see the contents of this module, it has everything that the student needs at a glance at the beginning of the term. So this is a quick reference to everything, uh, to any material that might be needed to be checked from time to time along the semester. So there's a why Shakespeare, she created a discussion forum for introductions to initiate socialization, I suppose. And then she has a survey for accessibility uh, for learning conditions and tech capability. And then of course, syllabus is there, major tasks are explained to, and she has a learning plan um, and a guide to synchronous sessions, consultations, school policies even, and her reading requirements and an online pledge and so on. So it's very, well, it's complete. It's so complete that um, really the student will waste no time messaging the teacher to ask uh, where can I find this or where is this uploaded. Further into her lesson module, so this is what it looks like. Um, she has the objectives and overview and assigned readings and the assignments. So notice that in the title bar of her module, there is a learning time indicated. So module one is a total of six hours in one sitting, but then um, it's further broken down into the parts of the module. So the art of annotation, for example, runs for one hour and 30 minutes. So this is a lot of effort from the teacher to actually approximate the learning time for the lesson and even for the entire module itself. But this helps the students so much in a way that they can see, they can decide for once if they'll just sit out the entire six hours or how do they budget their time to complete each module. So really, this is a labor of love to indicate lear the learning time. Okay, and her assignments are grouped so well. Um, so she has forum submissions, right? So she has all the discussion boards here grouped in the assignments. 
it also has closed reading worksheets. And here are the tests, so quizzes and the summatives and the final requirement. So, of course, we expect that they're all uh, clearly laid out how much percent, how much of the 100 they get a chunk of. So it's clear to the student how much work they need to put into, for example, if they're kind of low on the submissions, on the forum submissions, then they will see how it's going to affect their grade later on. So that's a good thing with laying everything out in the course, you know, from not only from the readings or resources or the reminders, but all the learning activities graded or not and assessment tasks are all there so that, you know, automatically in, in Canvas, you know that it's automatically um, translated to the grade book as a grading sheet. So it's very clear. Um, just to show you, here is module five of that um, course. Uh, you can see also the variety of her TLAs and assessments. So module five has a reading, has a forum, has films, and a 500 word blog contribution. So you can see how much thought was put into the planning of her course. Okay, and this one also, I'd like to highlight this. The teacher also made a separate module for her uh, recorded sessions so that anyone who missed the class, I suppose, can easily refer back to this. Okay, so all of that I've shown you, we, you know, it's really, we came to a conclusion that students learn to navigate and become familiar with the system in direct relation to how their teachers use it. You know, students can't enable the functions from their end. Unless their teachers use a certain feature, then that's the only time they will be aware of, you know, how to use it and navigate it and just really see the fine prints of the interface. For example, for every assignment, teachers can indicate what kind of file type they're requiring. So without the teacher initiating the use, students really wouldn't know that there's such a thing. And um, it needs practice for them to be able to see and absorb the interface um, and knowing all the little details that the teacher might require. And more importantly, we know now that learning is optimized through carefully planned activities. So from the feedback that we got that some of the teachers heavily relied on synchronous sessions and it didn't work for them because there's no opportunity to earn a grade, there's no opportunity to learn as much and the content material is basically the recording of that session. So really, um, I mean, there's no replacement for the physical presence of a teacher, but I think we, we owe it to our students to enable them to consciously and actively participate in their learning, to actually experience learning. And, you know, um, in return, us teachers will not be so burdened with worrying if they're okay because we're helping them out to become independent while you know at the same time we facilitate these things for them but the burden on us to actually spoon feed them is no longer there as they learn to navigate and manage their own learning all right so a well-designed course as we now know So here are what we found. So the whole term at a glance can be seen with a well-designed course. So overall tone of the class and expectations are set right at the beginning. So students more or less will have the conscious effort to manage themselves better. Um, they would know when to, well, when to slack off, when to take a rest, but more importantly, they would know when to work hard and how to do it smartly. And of course, with a well-designed course, there is a good variety of PLAs and assessment tasks and that they are fully aligned with the learning goals, to be sure. Also, materials are available and easy to find. There's clear communication with the Canvas announcements, Canvas inbox, although I suppose teachers have their emails always available. And of course, there's a good balance of teaching and learning because teachers and students alike are both active in the course. But 
last but not least, look at this grade book. So with all the assignments, with all the activities uh, uploaded and created inside, um, you can see that the grades are easily tracked and recorded, and that makes for a transparent record keeping. So the whole point of this is not just to, not just to show the grades, but it's really more of letting the students know how to regulate themselves. So awareness of one's class standing will help them to direct their pace and overall manage themselves better. So a well-designed course makes for a well-designed learning experience. So what are the lessons that we learned after all this, um, after the feedback that we got, the findings that we concluded and the responses that we made. And here we are. I think we're well on our way to a well-designed learning experience. So here are two things. The first is tech responsibly. Um, it's really about knowing your tools. So for us, um, we had Canvas for a while since 2018, but it was only at the pandemic that we started to use it really, really well. Um, I guess um, it has to be compelled. Uh, unfortunately, it has to happen that way, but I guess there's no other um, way to, to really immerse ourselves in learning Canvas. So master your tools, master what you're most comfort comfortable with, at least for now. Don't be compelled to be high tech or use too many all at once, just for the sake of variety. Um, when you know your tools well, you can easily and appropriately match it to your learning objectives. And, you know, given all the thought that you'd be giving into the planning, your, your teaching style, your content, your learning, uh, the learning conditions of your students. So all of that, you will be teaching wholeheartedly. And I guess that's the really, that, that, those are the main takeaways after a year of online learning for us. So thank you for coming in and I hope you learned something from our learnings as well. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Anza. Um, so that's a, that's a quick summary of, uh, of lessons that we learned um, over the past year. I, th I think what Za has uh, left unmentioned is that um, obviously these are the things that work. There are practices that didn't work the opposite of that poor course design or uh, poor organization of materials and other practices like that. So it hasn't been a perfect year for us. We still have a lot of work to do. Um, and just for the participants, I just wanted to tell the participant to remind the participants that transitioning to effective online teaching is not a sprint. It's not going to be done in one school year or in a matter of a few months of, with a few months of training, but it's going to be a continuous journey as we bring along different cohorts of teachers, early adopters, um, those who are eager to use but might have some challenges in learning the technology. And then even a small group of teachers who might be resistant to change. So we'll uh, need to continue working on this, but I hope that introduces you to some key ideas that worked for us. Um, and now we'll open the session to a Q&A. There are some questions in the, in the Q&A portion, um, which have been answered, but if anyone would like to post a few more questions, we, we can take them now. Hey, Jason. Um, also, if anyone wants to, um, I guess, raise their hand or ask a question verbally, we can certainly uh, accommodate that uh, in addition to the Q&A. Okay. Um, okay, while well, waiting for some people to type in questions, I'll read out the ones that have been posted and have been answered. Um, there's a common question about whether you have a a link to the recording of this webinar. Yes, it will be sent out to your admins and they can share it with you once the recording is available. Um, Rio also posted, um, I'm going to post it again. 
the link to the community space where recordings of links to recordings of past uh, webinars have are also available so uh, specific topics or uh, you can find other topics uh, there and i'm sure you'll find a lot of other useful materials there um okay um, yeah, we have a couple of questions or uh, well, hands raised, which I'll start to unmute microphone. So yeah. uh, Jose right. Marie Carpena, and, and then I'll pass it over to you, Jason. I'll just manage it. Okay. Yeah. Yes, good uh, morning. Yeah, good morning, Jose. Jose. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Um, may I ask, how did you handle if there were any at least, how did you handle faculty members who were sort of reluctant in using the advanced features of Canvas and just stuck with typically posting modules and uh, just hold synchronous Zoom sessions? Um, okay, so I'll take I'll take that question uh, because it has to do with uh, what we're trying to do as uh, from the whole department. So there we still have courses where teachers barely use canvas and essentially hold all classes in a synchronous manner whether it's zoom or google meet uh, what we've done the past year we is to in higher ed it's a little hard to impose a specific way of teaching on the teachers uh, so it's really a matter of working with their department chairs or program directors to show them what works and what doesn't work so what we've done is to run the learning experience surveys and then uh, collate the results. And we've even uh, put together a, a compilation of comments for particular courses. And we've gone to the department chairs to sit down and talk with them about the results. The idea is we don't want to uh, give a single formula on how to teach uh, uh, applicable to all teachers, but we want to address uh, particular difficulties uh, with particular courses or particular teachers based on uh, student feedback. So we think that that approach will be more useful than just telling them that it's not working and you're not going to be effective doing that. So we are uh, basing a lot of the suggestions on how to improve their course delivery. Uh, on the feedback that we actually get from students. So some of the some of the more concrete feedback we get is that students get tired attending Zoom lectures or Google Meet lectures the whole time. Um, they have difficulty sometimes uh, with connections and miss out on certain portions of the lecture or sometimes the whole lecture if if they happen to have technical problems. Um, they also wish that they had material that they could study or work on more independently outside the designated lecture hours. So with that kind of feedback, we're hoping that uh, department chairs can help their particular teachers um, improve the course design and provide uh, better material for this online environment to those teachers. I hope that helps. Thanks, Jason. Um, so another question that's come through the chat now is, uh, can you suggest topics to be included for in-service training for faculty members before the start of the school year? So maybe I might rephrase that. What would be the top three topics that you may um, uh, deliver uh, before the uh, school year? Uh, okay, so I think you can take care of that in terms of explaining what we are trying to do with the, with the two rounds of training activities we've organized. So as I mentioned earlier, um, in our Learning to Teach online course, we put out an emphasis for teaching and learning activities and assessment tasks, uh, specifically to be aligned to learning objectives. So you can gauge, um, you can have a review of the syllabus of the past academic year and look into that. Um, and based on the learning plans that were carried out, if the, the objective has been met. If not, you can, you can exactly, you know, um, do a refresher on these things because I understand that not all teachers are education graduates. Some of them are industry practice industry practitioners. So it's really good to instill a pedagogy lesson every now and then, just to you know refresh things. And also, um, I forgot to mention in that learning to teach online that we ran last year, we 
talked about SAM R. So it's a good introduction to educational technology. So you have the substitution, augmentation, modification, and um, replacement. Did I get that right? So yeah, you can really take uh, you can take baby steps on the topics. You don't need to overwhelm your teachers that this is what they have to learn. So I mean, the way we did it, we thought it was. Um, we thought it was easily paced already, but of course, we still got feedback that for some teachers, it felt like going back to school again. Um, so that is for our first LTTO. So we are running LTTO again this time around, and we are focused on reflective teaching, and we introduced the TPACT framework, so a technological, pedagogical, and content knowledge framework. So um, it's all very practical in a sense. Um, for one thing, our exercises in that course are all about journal entry and reflection because really that's the point of why we're, well, not teaching, but you know why we're introducing the concept of reflective teaching. So teachers really have to make time for themselves to look back, um, even for even if the class just happened a while ago or a few hours ago. It's it's important that teachers have a quiet time to think of what transpired and you know, of course, highlight the good things and address the things that could have been better. So that's for reflective teaching. And for the TPAC, um, this is related to the practical lesson that we have, tech responsibly. So with the knowledge, a good knowledge of TPAC, um, teachers will learn how to use the best tools they have at hand in their most in the level that they are most comfortable with and you know they can easily since they're comfortable with the tools and they know their content well and they're sure of their teaching style then it's easy to match whichever tool will go with a learning activity so you can try those things um tpac framework reflective teaching and we also have sam r so yeah, those are the su suggested topics I can give. Excellent, thank you so much, Zah. So I'm gonna take a, a, a hand raise from the audience. Uh, so Ferdinand Nicholas, um, I'm just going to turn on your microphone, so feel free to um, speak. Hi, good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay, thanks Ramsey. Um, I'm just wondering uh, about the experience of UANP in terms of um, student commitment. Um, we know that um, uh, online learning, there's a very low level of commitment. Of course, um, it's different if they're officially enrolled, um, pursuing a degree. <clears throat> but um, of course, even now, um, our experience, uh, we've been using Canvas for the first year, actually, uh, um, just uh, the past school year. Of course, um, there are our experience that uh, there are a lot of students who, of course, have found difficulty transitioning to online um, learning. And um, of course, we try to uh, run after them, you know, uh, get them, um, get them uh, um, committed or, or um, try to bring them back on, into the class. Was there any um, support given by UANP for its students as they transition to uh, online learning and um, the use of Canvas to prevent dropouts um, and, and um, that, that uh, type of problem? Okay, I can take this question, Ramsey. Uh, hi, Dr. Nicholas. Um, so when, at the beginning, we, we knew that two key sets of stakeholders um, needed to be addressed. Where first was the teachers to make sure that they knew how to use the LMS. And secondly, that they would be able to redesign their courses for better delivery within the LMS. And the second was the students. Although um, it's a common assumption that students are digital natives and they can easily adapt, which in general is true, um, learning a specific uh, platform with specific features like Canvas also takes a bit of training. So we worked with uh, stu our student affairs office to create um, uh, the equivalent of the LTTO for students. Uh, it, had, it had two components. Uh, one was managing the self essentially uh, with, in, with 
with content on time management, managing energy, setting up a good place where you can study, uh, carving out a place where you can do uh, schoolwork within the house. Um, also some self-assessment of uh, related to um, the ability to manage stress, pressure, uh, time. And then we also created a tutorial course on Canvas that since we were dealing with about 2000 students all at the same time, we opted to make it purely asynchronous um, with a self-enroll link so that students could, uh, if they spend maybe 30 to 45 minutes on that course, they would be familiar with at least the basic features of Canvas, how to navigate through it, where to find their grades, where to find assignments, et cetera, things like that. So at the beginning we did that, um, we made materials available for them. We held a few sessions um, to explain and to demo it, a few synchronous sessions to explain and to demo it to them. And then um, throughout the school year, we also provided an, um, we also set up a dedicated student help desk um, that is meant to address uh, learning experience issues. Uh, so if, uh, for example, we entertain questions like, uh, what, if, what to do if my teacher hasn't really been updating the grade book, uh, then we elevate that, that response to uh, the department concerned and we, we wait until it's, there's a resolution and then we report back to the student. So that's the support mechanism that we set up uh, within UANP to do that. It's again, as I mentioned earlier, it hasn't been a perfect experience, but in general, I think we, uh, we managed to put in place uh, a decent support system to help students through this transition also. So I hope that helps. Thanks, Jason. Um, so there's just a question related uh, to this uh, directed to Azar. Uh, so my question is, do we need to reduce the time for synchronous sessions and increase the asynchronous activities to make our students acquire independent learning capabilities on their own? Thanks. Well, not really to reduce the synchronous sessions. I mean, you carry on as it's needed, but really the point is to provide enough learning opportunity for students. So maybe put the synchronous sessions to a minimal, like um, once or twice a week, and maybe not so long. Maybe you can call your students in in smaller groups for, for example, 30 minutes, just to, you know, um, e even just to get feedback and not so much of holding a synchronous class. It really depends, I think, also on the needs of your student. Um, in that regard, um, course design also touches a lot on the teacher's flexibility to accommodate students, you know, as they come, maybe as individuals or in small groups, if they need um, live intervention, for that matter, if really they're the type who just need some, some hand holding, um, to an extent, but it's really not, you know, limiting your synchronous session so much. I mean, if it helps the students, yes, go ahead and do it. But um, just really keep in mind to provide enough opportunities for, for everyone to make the most out of. Thanks, Zah. And uh, we'll take the last question. Um, we do say there's a lot of questions that have come through the Q&A, uh, which both Catherine, Meta, Adam, Jason have all been addressing. Um, so feel free. Uh, so we, I don't know if we'll be able to address them all, um, but uh, if there is time, we will email uh, responses to those answers as part of the Zoom link and uh, Global Priority Services uh, link as well. Uh, we have a last question from Darwin. Uh, so Darwin, I'm just going to unmute your microphone and feel free to speak. Hello. Hi Darwin, we can hear you. Okay, my question is, will, will Canvas introduce new applications or platforms in their, I mean, new applications and features in their platforms? Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Uh, we'll take this one from in the instructor side. Uh, so yes, uh, Canvas uh, Canvas is continuously developing um, as we are on the cloud and we continuously release new features. Uh, what we'll do, what I'll do is just direct you to um, the community space. So if you go to canvas community uh, dot, sorry, 
community.canvaslms.com. Um, there is a place where there are release notes available there um, in the Canvas, uh, on the Canvas community. And there you'll be able to see all the new features uh, that will be available and coming out. Um, so yes, in short to your answer, yes, Canvas is continuously uh, developing and improving with new features. Thank you. All right, awesome. Uh, Jason and Za, thank you so much uh, for, uh, firstly, uh, Za for the presentation and Jason for uh, facilitating today's session and also responding to the many questions that we had today. Um, so again, if we can uh, give them a nice round of applause in the chat, uh, <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, and Adam always giving the claps there. All right, excellent. Um, so just to wrap up today's session, uh, just a couple of reminders, which I'll share on my screen. So this is, again, just a reminder that this is part of a series of webinars uh, that are that will be part of the Canvas Philippines webinar series in partnership uh, with the Canvas Philippines user group committee uh, that Jason is part of. Uh, the next session will be on the 21st of July, 2021. Uh, for those who have registered via the Eventbrite link, we'll be sharing uh, the registration link for the next webinar there. And also we'll be sharing it directly with the university's um, administrative team, which uh, ideally would be able to uh, provide you that information further um, and then the last session will be on the 29th of July which will release further details around in the coming weeks um, last point on this as well is that we'll also include the zoom link uh, from today's recording also the global priority services uh, resource area where you can find other webinars and useful information from the canvas community um, and then lastly, on top of this, there has been a lot of requests uh, for participation certificates uh, for attending these webinar sessions. Uh, so what we'll do, we'll include that also uh, in the email that we'll share across there. And uh, we, can, we can also quickly share it in the chat here uh, for you to fill out. Uh, so please ensure that you fill out the full details and we'll be able to provide you a certificate of participation in the coming weeks. Other than that, um, again, uh, a deep appreciation and thank you for everyone attending here on behalf of the Instructure team, myself, Adam and Rio and the broader uh, Instructure uh, team. Um, and also uh, from the Canvas Philippines User Group Committee, uh, from Jason uh, to the other representatives there. And again, thank you so much as well for the great presentation and really looking forward to seeing everyone in the upcoming two weeks uh, with the remainder of the webinars. Thanks everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank everyone. Thank you, everyone.